Oh no! So we're live. <laughs> and what a jackass! <laughs> and you're muted. <laughs> First casualty. We're a professional. Oh, right. Go back to my oh, There right. go. <laughs> Gosh, well, you know what? You didn't even roll. So good luck. Screw all of you. Screw hey, all of you. You get what you get. Rolls murder hobo tonight. Oh, my gosh. We're doing Iron GM yet again. We're going to sell you a seat, but you'll only need the edge. I, no, that was good. My heart wasn't in it. I apologize. Uh, it was David. He he sucked the joy out of my life today. Um, I do that. I do that. He don't. And, and now I'm heartbroken. Stricken with grief. I don't know what to do with myself, so I jizzed in a jar, and that's oh, all I Oh, my can God. Say. There we go. Blame I'll Ian. Have... It was his thoughts. Wow. I have no idea. Oh, we, just let, we just lost viewers. <laughs> uh, at least my mom. Uh, she said she promised she would watch today, and now she most certainly is not, so yeah. that's all good. That's all good. Oh my god. <laughs> Guys, let's go through the spiel real quick. You can follow us on Twitch. You can follow us on Twitter. If you want to take a look at our YouTube archives, you can do that. If you want to hit us up, be on the show like Ian here, who has never been on the show before and is about to get entirely screwed later on this evening with yeah. Iron GM. Uh, <laughs> we will certainly do that to him later. Uh, but you could be that person too. You could also be that person not this Saturday, but next Saturday during one of our one shots. Just hit us up at Twitter or at mhoboinc at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to buy some really awesome stuff, you can head over to our store. We are slowly working on some even more awesome stuff for you can buy that you can put on your skateboards, on your bath mats, on your phone cases, on your condoms, on your um, what? As long as it's not that cred bullshit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but really, what says cred more than a condom, than just eruption? Whoa, uh, shit. Oh, sl casualty. Slumber. That is a casualty. Ah, uh, son of a bitch. All right. Um, if you want to look at our faces and not top. listen to us, or... Or the Reverse opposite, back. then I suggest listening to our podcast, where it's audio only. You can listen to it in your car ride, and you won't get pulled over unless you're doing perjurious hoboey things like killing cashiers and and taking their feet. I don't know why you would do that because there's bubble gum wow. in the convenience stores. Kyle, I think my delicious. friends are gonna pay you a visit. Huh? I my friends are going to pay you a visit. They already have, and they'll never catch me again. Uh, <laughs> finally, wow. we'd like to thank our sponsors, Oddfish Games. We have the wonderful Adventure Sense, uh, How to RPG with Your Cat, The Shine Project, and lots of other cool stuff coming along down the pipeline, I am sure, because I know they're making a Shine Project just for your uh, tabletop games, and I'm excited to look at that. Uh, and then we have Pirate Dog Dice. For one you're rolling like shit, Pirate Ooh. Dog Dice. Uh, you Too big red. Oh, gosh. What are guys? Oh, that's 20. First roll. <laughs> <laughs> hey, all, these are all 20. That's why I roll so well. That's why I roll so well. Okay. Uh, hey, Kyle, do we have anything nine. huge? Bes my, my penis? No. Oh. Your ego. Yes. Ooh. But wow. only, only slightly outweighed by the epicness that is Murder Hobo Cop! Hey. Yeah, we're going to murder Hobo Cancer. Uh, uh, tickets are on sale currently. I wasn't if I did it right. to the conversation. So you can buy your tickets now. I believe they're $2 a person. Is that correct? Depends. It varies on the game. Some games are better than others. Uh, Ian and I, our games suck. So uh, we charge nothing or two bucks. So, We're free. Yeah. So if you Ian's... don't like the game, you get your money back. <laughs> For his. <laughs> For mine, screw it. I'm I'm vacationing in Aruba with those two bucks. Oh yeah. You say you're vacationing in Arugula? 
I mean, yeah. I've been to Trader Joe's and their uh, refrigerator section is quite nice this time of year. I actually just planted a shitload of arugula in my window box. Wow. Go, folks. And so he will be vacating in, in arugula. Vacating in arugula? In it. Vacating. E evacuating in arugula. Yeah. Evacuating in arugula. Just watch <laughs> yeah, well, out. They're a little bit spiny to you know, rub on the hiney. Good thing that people who watch this show aren't nearly as new as the people who watch the games. Otherwise, they'd be highly offended by now. They are. Maybe they are. Yeah, I'm new to this and I'm offended, but I'm just hiding it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the, the, you know, disappointment in my face every time I'm on this show. So I don't think it's disappointing enough, to be honest with you. Oh, you could be God. more disappointed. Ooh. Hmm. Oh, uh, Good news, there's only about oh, that oh, much oh. of you shows. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, I can fix it. It'll be fine. It'll be dandy. Uh, hey, uh, hey, are you going to give us our random shit in the chat, or what are we doing with that? Oh, well, you guys didn't ask for it in the green room, so I'm just saying. Hey, I, I, hey, I, I pre-said that I am, I'm going this blind, so... Uh, completely and utterly, apparently. Yeah. All right, guys, it is between the roles. We do have the Iron GM tonight. Before we get into last week's games, I am going to have Frank roll me a D10, please. Four. Four. Gnomes, rock gnomes, particularly. Ah, you guys are fucked. I got this. Oh, All geez. right. Ian, give me a D8, please. Certainly. One, of course. Mountain dwarves. Mountain dwarves. Mountain dwarves. And David, give me D a D six. Now give me another D eight. Another D eight. Yeah. Another D eight. Why would you give me a D six? I don't know. It was it was going down so incrementally. Yeah, that that was it. <laughs> and then you had eight. It doesn't matter because I rolled a six anyway. <laughs> there we go. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ooh. Uh, give me goblins. Ooh. All, okay. right. all right. Guys, that's me being the nicest of all hosts tonight, giving them a head start on the Iron GM, where these DMs are going to give me brand spanking new lore that is not any of the old boring stuff as a tribute to last week's Between the Rolls, where it was all about races. But enough about racism right now. Let's talk about cacophony. So wait, speak, but as speaking though of racism, do we, are we doing the ones that we respectively rolled or do we make lore for all three? The just ones, the just the one ones we roll, roll, please. <laughs> oh, I, 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 like I said, I, I don't know. I thought You're I was going to start rolling for like ingredients and spices. So then, like, Ooh, I'd get that's... like figs and carrots. Mm. I don't know. Figs there we carrots. go. You make uh, sweet glazed carrots with a, uh, a, a fig topping. Maybe some bacon. Some Throw bacon, fig. Oh, yeah. Ooh, fantasy cooking show. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's, yeah. Yeah. Baba Yaga. It well, is a uh, flavorful cacophony in your mouth. Let me just wait. tell you that right now. But speaking of cacophonies, yeah, David, we left what with a mouthful of Thursday? something. <laughs> well, last Thursday we picked up where we left off. It turns out that the cavern that we were bivouacking in turned out to be the Hall of the Mountain King. So, so the players that night were myself, uh, Caitlin, and Carrie. So that is Zadar. That is Daphne, and that is Camille. So, anyway, yeah. So our guy, uh, what's his name again? Nibby. <laughs> Nibby. <laughs> turned out to be completely useless, because <laughs> uh, as it turns out, as we discovered, it was the Hall of the Mountain King. The Mountain King had pets, two polar bears, by that matter. <laughs> So the, the polar bears were making quick work, work out of us, and it was not going well. Finally, we managed to dispass the last of them, although Zadar was getting his ass kicked by one, and Daphne just took the time just to skin and make uh, earmuffs out of another while I'm currently fighting. Yeah. Getting your shit pushed in. Don't, don't, help, don't help the spellcaster at all, you know? So... 
So anyway, folks, so we finish up with, with that. We just dispatch the thing. We play, oh, I don't know, some kind of game with trying to open the 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 um the bar that was barring the door, the only door that we found in the hall. When we do, when we find out, uh, we finally get it open with the use of Daphne's fly. Uh, so, so yeah, we did the whole flying around and using it as a crane and stuff like that. So anyway, running reconnaissance, turns out it is like an abandoned city out there, but is it really abandoned? I don't know. Uh, there was some footprints, kind of looks humanoid that, that got lost in the snow drift and snowfall that fell. We ended up trying to, to make our way out, but we noticed that there were other creatures out there. What were they, Frank? They were like flying deer harpy. So... Uh, par paratons. Paratons. I, I think that's how you pronounce it, paratons. Oh, yeah. We wanted to hide. Nibby was, uh, was like, that's lunch. And I was just like, no, we have lunch right here. The polar bears that we caught and uh, killed. So anyway, Get a long rest, recuperate, because, yeah, we were pretty close to dying. And, Candy asses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we waited for the cover of night, fall out, and uh, make our way through the city, pretty much undetected. Uh, as we make our way out through the city, uh, we are uh, suddenly we spot a conflict. Uh, there is a battle going on, six human humanoid figures uh fighting two owl bears and yeah it was not going well looked like none of them survived by the time we got there and uh yeah found one survivor still breathing maybe made quick work of it because it turned out to be one of the cannibal uh yeah viking like people so yep so didn't go well. There was possibly of a third survivor. Yeah, that didn't last long. Nimby made quick work out of that too. So. You guys had the chance to stop him. We did. We did. For all we know, it could have been the chieftain starter and things we might have worked out, but nope. So, yeah. So that was the episode, folks. You get a chance to check it out. It uh, It's a doozy. Yeah, Caitlin's Chaos Queen. Again. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> so. So anyway, good episode. Check it out. It was in our archives. So that think. sounds delightful. And you know what? That Caitlin, she is just a free spirit. Such a free spirit and on such a wonderful holiday celebrating freedom. And speaking of freedom, there was the day before the freest of all days. And that was that was Saturday where we had freedom fun. A one shot of great freedom. Freedom. That is wow. the shittiest segue you could have given me. <laughs> uh, folks, on Saturday we had a one shot. It was called Freedom Fun. Uh, essentially, uh, Jeff, John, Rob, and Carol uh, were coming into town on a ship. The ship had been damaged. They were headed towards Cathaway, everybody's favorite city. Uh, the ship did sustain some damage to its mast, had to put into port. Uh, the party didn't really understand why the crew was upset that they were pulling into the port of freedom during Emancipation Day. Uh, a quick rundown of lore from the captain and some of the crewmen uh, deciphered that freedom itself was built on the concept of freedom, so all races were welcome. It was originally designed and created and founded by former slaves. Some of these slaves included a contingent of Minotaur uh, who do not drink except upon Emancipation Day. These creatures of great cunning, great skill, and great wisdom uh, have invented something they called pyrotechnics uh, that they like to shoot off during Emancipation Day. Uh, the party had a little bit of trouble. Well, the party didn't have any trouble. Uh, Carol's character had a whole lot of trouble as uh, a herd of cattle were brought in for fertility rights. Uh, Carol's <laughs> character was the only one who failed to get out of the way, and she got 
nearly dead. Uh, <laughs> Kevin Bacon at the end of Animal House, pretty exactly. much. Exactly. <laughs> she sustained a lot of damage. The first of a few occasions. Uh, they then found their way into old Pepe's tavern, uh, where uh, they discovered Mortimer J. Sneed and his young uh, Ward Zephyr were there. They are still on their way to uh, the Grand Academy. So they were. she got to speak with them because she, her character was the only one that was familiar with them. Uh, the other three got to wander around uh, with Rob protecting uh, his boss man, John. Uh, there was a wee bit of a problem as uh, Jeff seemed to uh, almost kill a bunch of warlocks. Uh, the warlocks got mad, but fortunately, something happened with the barbarian table. The barbarians blamed it on the warlocks. Shit got real. Anyway, the uh, viceroy in charge of freedom hired the group to go ahead and guard one of two bridges. Uh, leading to the lowlands, a.k.a. the Minos district. Uh, they, the Viceroy also found a group of holy paladins, as in, holy shit, I can't believe I even bothered to put in paladins. They guarded one bridge. Uh, the party attempted to guard the other bridge. The pyrotechnics played a rather massive part in Carol having her ship blown up, uh, similar to Lieutenant Dan. Um, all's well that ends well, right, folks? Nobody completely died. Uh, I was going to say, I think somebody did, didn't they? <laughs> she was on Lifeline. Uh, it was not a good night for Carol's character at all. Uh, she took a significant amount of damage. Uh, the good news is, most of that damage was caused quasi-friendly fire uh, because the pyrotechnics being aimed at the party were set upon kegs of ale, highly flammable ale. And when you have half the party charge in for melee and one member of that party decide to throw fire, uh, it is in the archive. It is still on Twitch. Take a look at it. It's called Freedom fun. And as Kyle said, uh, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, the one shot. This Saturday, uh, it's Calamity. Uh, Kyle, back to you. Oh, and mm. then the next day, there was Sunday. And Margu did not, not, did not play. play. Did not, did not play. play at all. So we have nothing, nothing so to talk about. We're, we're, we're done. We're 17 minutes in. We yeah, got 45 minutes to do this. Ian, you know, you do a lot better than Carol. She usually talks right over everyone, takes at least half an hour. We appreciate you having I, I've, I've got to get emails. <laughs> I've got to emails, man. I so kind of noticed that so during many. the game Saturday, okay. and I was like, Good. okay, can we play the game here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> All right. Guys, it is Iron GM. Like I told uh, the audience earlier, but I'm going to re uh, uh, do this <laughs> so that I can give uh, David enough time to think of the origin story for his relord goblins. Mm. Right? Because I forgot honestly what I gave you and I didn't actually mark anything down. Okay. Oh. But. Ideally, uh, what we're doing is we're taking the classic races mm -hmm. um, and we are going to reskin them, reflavor them, something completely different, something that we talked about the entirety of last month. Um, so instead of our usual dwarves being hewn from the very stone, elves being the followers of Coriander and then getting trapped in the bodies that they're in, or gnomes getting tortured by illithids turning into darrow we're going to come up with something <laughs> brand new brand spanking crazy and gnome we are swiddlings. there we gnome go swiddlings. oh those are the fun ones honestly oh, yeah uh, but i feel like i have bought just enough time for david to tell us the origin stories of his fantastic goblins yes yes the fantastic goblins well, as it turns out, goblins are not fey in this reworking. They are actually descended from two proto-goblins. Uh, yes, proto-goblins. 
goblins were created in a magical lab and they do the same thing they do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. So, oh yeah, think of the goblins as brain, pretty much. So, yeah, that's what so we got. Are they homunculuses gone wrong or <laughs> they are homunculi gone wrong? <laughs> All right, that's very interesting. Uh, Ian, I believe we gave you the mountain doors. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and you're ready. You don't need me to buy you any oh, no. extra oh, I, time. I've okay, got, good. I've good. got I've got pages of I was listening, so I've got pages. Oh, he was ready so. to go. Oh, he was ready. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh. I'll make the most out of that thick jam. Um, <laughs> so anywho, so if uh, as a, a quick aside for people who are familiar with like herbal medicine, traditional Ayurvedic medicine, whatnot. Uh, there's an interesting substance that's called, I, I'm pronouncing it wrong for people on the thread who wants to like later say that person pronounced it wrong. It's uh, like a chilajit or something similar to that. But basically it's natural material that's collected on the sides of mountains and through putrefaction and shedding minerals. It is a very rich organic substance full of minerals and fulvic acids and other things. But Beginning in the world that didn't have a magical regeneration of, of uh, natural races that spontaneously arose from some type of cosmic force, uh, thinking about evolution, that organic material filtering through mountains over millennia and millennia, accumulating all the minerals and nutrients needed to spontaneously arise organic life, coalescing in the areas where natural ley lines form began the early protoforms of life which naturally, phylogically speaking, split into two major race categories, slime forms and things that began to make a hominid shapes. Um, so it's from this that we actually develop a whole family tree splitting between uh, rock gnomes, mountain dwarves, and the goblins. The uh, rock gnomes were eventually hominids that formed that were content of being uh, their own hominid forms that were just fine eating minerals and having a, a subterranean life form. The goblins were things that were feasting on hominids that were in a fleshy form, also being kind of scavengers and horrible things. But the unique things that mountain dwarves were is that they became themselves a hominid form that became seeds for future mountains. Their function is to go out and adventure and accumulate vast amounts of minerals and metal objects, uh, hence why they need to adventure. At upon the eighth level, after they have had a large hoard of these materials, they must consume them in a rapid amount of time and become themselves the seed of a mountain that will eventually grow and expand with time to then be part of the ecosystem to create this life force that then starts to make the other racial um, forms. Now, do we get to the part with class abilities and benefits or other things, or is it just basic lore at this point? Basic origin lore at this point. I think someone is showing you guys up and is already yeah, kind he of. Did. He's vying for the an crowd. Interesting link is a natural pet, a patron god for all. Uh, not only will you have like a natural dwarven deity, but Jubilex can come into play as perhaps not a wholly evil deity, but naturally no, a progenitor true. life force. You know, I spelled that one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, no, nope. yeah, it does feel like a college course in D and D. I have a, I have a tree and everything. I got a tree. Oh, you got the tree. Oh, He's got it brought down by Jesus. All right, Jesus guys, uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, Ian wins the Iron GM. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's over, folks. It's over. It's done. Boom. <laughs> Ian wins. Uh, David, you know what dance. you have to come up with next. So uh, try to top that. No, uh, <laughs> Frank, <laughs> you yeah, have uh, uh, won the Rock Gnomes. Uh, obviously, we're not taking strictly from Ian's. What, what's the origin story of your Rock Gnomes? You know what? I'm going to go ahead and play off Ian's uh, <laughs> course. Uh, I, I think I aced the first quiz. So I'm going to say that the runoff, uh, the Gnomes were not created, the Rock Gnomes were not created as a third race. Rock gnomes were created as a runoff of all the minerals that didn't suit the stronger, more powerful uh, dwarves. Unfortunately for them, those minerals equated over to IQ points or wisdom, uh, making them much smarter. Uh, they work smarter, not harder. Uh, they do not fight nearly as well. However, in this case, 
those basic uh, minerals, also called vitamins over across the pond, uh, allowed the rock gnomes to go ahead and earn a, a greater degree of knowledge, uh, maybe imparted by the ancient ones that created the three races, or maybe just by luck of the draw, they got their feet first and crawled out of the lagoon uh, and evolved faster just because they were smarter. Uh, the rock gnomes themselves have gone ahead and continued to live among the cracks and crevices, aka the shadows of the dwarven population. Uh, but they know, they know they're smarter than the dwarves. So that's my take. <laughs> Are you turning gnomes into an evil race again? Yeah, you just wanted something in different. The shadows and just you wanted you, you know what you wanted something different, okay? I did, yes, I did. Screw those nice little tinkers with the huge names. <laughs> These creatures have no names. They're only known as or nice <laughs> or oh whoa 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 hey you can't say that about his mother. What the hell's the matter with you? <laughs> this is a family show. God. No, Come it on. has never been a famous show. Where's my hotler again? I, 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 I no, think, no, no, no. I think Kyle's comment from earlier cements the fact this is not a uh, famous oh, yeah. show. I totally forgot about that comment. Uh, uh, the FCC won't. So. Uh, as long yeah, as you FCC aren't new, they don't care. <laughs> but yes, that, that is my origin story for them. Sure. All right. Well, hey, let's get back down to David. We're talking about legendary heroes, figures, uh, who exemplify goblinness in all its shapes and forms <clears throat> that all goblins, you know, either curse or bless in the name of. What do you got for us? Oh, Nildog, of course. Oh, Nildog. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Merry Little Prankster, no, actually turns out to be a keen genius. So yes, he was actually the first proto-goblin. So when the goblins were made, uh, they were made uh, with uh, attributes that their mage creator bestowed upon them, mostly aspects of his personality. So we're talking, you know, Renaissance man, kind of food kind of sore and all that. So you have all these goblins that spill out and each of them have a personality. They have free will. They also, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. They, um, I'm thinking on the spot here. So with these traits they picked up, I mean, some of them are like, you know, I mean, they get hired out as like wine tasters or, you know, they, they no, get lectures goblin sommeliers. Like <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> So they became, uh, at first they were intended to be servants, but then, you know, their, their creator being gracious emancipated them and said, look, you have free will. You could either work for me, for me if you want, I can provide anything you want for you, or you can venture out into the world. And basically that's what happened. Neil Dog being the proto one and all that was kind of like the one that led the way for the ones uh, that wanted to venture outside and go for it. So instead of being the prankster and all that, the spirit and stuff like that, he became like the original leader that led the goblins out from where they were created. So, and piss so on is this, uh, uh, Nilbog, uh, um, does he have what, uh, um, uh, an aspect of thoughtfulness that the goblins try to strive for or just mm -hmm. obsessed? for life and to live every moment that the goblins themselves strive he for. He is a very much uh, uh, got a lust <laughs> for life and I mean he is this he, he is pretty much everything that the creator could, could put in, in, into him from of his own you know personality and essence and stuff like that. So he's smart. They're magic. You know, he can, they can be magic users. They're, you know, uh, they try to live their life a, as the fullest. So, you know, I mean, you wouldn't think, everybody thinks evil little goblins. Well, sure. these are merry little goblins, you know, so. Do they have a short lifespan, which is why they try and live life? Unfortunately, the fullest, they do. They still uh -huh. have the goblin lifespan. So, 
So they tried to live as much as they can. I think what the goblin life span the longest is what sixty years, something like that. <clears throat> yeah, right. Something like that. Or or thirty. Thirty years. Thirty years. I like that's thirty a, years better. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. Like yeah. You thought turtles were bad. No, no, goblins are goblins. Flies. Was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they tried to live their life for the fullest, and Neil Dog was the one that showed them the way. So all right, all right. Uh, Ian, back to you, the legendary figure, the main mountain dwarf himself. What do you got? Uh, so I imagine that as Grandfather Cragbeard, uh, the first of the hominid dwarves that was able to take and break itself from the whole of the earth and create the first large mountain. Um, it is through his explorations and his accumulation of mass and mineral um, that eventually became a, a progenitor to the other um, dwarves itself, creating the, the stock of the race. So after becoming a large majestic mountain that evolved over years of uh, formation, that its front of its uh, the face of the mountain is just loaded with this organic primordial matter that then say filters through the earth to become the wellspring of other uh, races and especially the dwarves themselves. So I imagine that as part of the dwarf uh, race that as it venerates its uh, progenitor that to help uh, with the production of, of race uh, would be to take any type of foe and enemy that it's killed and fling it on the side of the mountain so that the materials from the bodies can kind of filter through the earth. So it's a mountain that's absolutely loaded with corpses that is leaking this material. Wow. And it's quite frightening. You know, boulders roll down the face of this, carrying this primordial goo that then over the earth kind of seeds um, this, uh, this race. Um, and it's seen as a, uh, as a point of veneration to... Uh, kind of heap these uh, uh, corpses of trophies of things um, as part of, not as a grisly, chaotic, or evil act, but as an act of loving creation and veneration as part of the, the life cycle. Circle of life. That is frightening <laughs> and delightful. <laughs> and I'm, all at the same I'm, I'm time, trying to man. think about this. That's here. Mount Rushmore just covering corpses. <laughs> That's the American It's pretty much. It's Mount Rushmore. <laughs> Fourth of July, corpses. everyone. I mean, we you take this absolute original bloodlust of mountain dwarves that you have and creation, and we just we make it a little bit bigger and grander. <laughs> and well, think think about it: the dwarves are usually uh, typecasted as like metallurgists. Mm. But so imagine, imagine like more shamanistic, natural dwarves that shun, yeah. you know, mining uh, instead of mining because that's an affront to part of this life cycle. Instead, it's working with crude rock materials and armors and uh, things that have been scavenged. And utilizing those metals and things are instead used to make other mountains because ore and things are such vital to the lifeblood of mountains. And instead, it's it's crushed things that oppose the natural law of Father Cragbeer and perhaps Jubilex to degree, and take those who are affront to this natural sense of law and heap them in piles so that they can you know start the life cycle. So. <laughs> I'm gonna have a, a mit I'm gonna have a minor in history here in a minute. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh yeah, sounds like some of my so, professors. <laughs> I mean, at this point, I'm sorry, I, I've got to ask you and clarify yeah. a little bit here because I'm yeah. loving this a little bit, and plus, I did this for David as well. Uh, uh, essentially, they don't like anyone who digs into a mountain and takes ores. They see this as <clears throat> as theft, as, as a violation theft. of natural order. So think about natural law theorists for people who did do anthropology or ethics or law. Like that, that is a violation exactly. of the natural order of the finest. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they also see goblins doing that because instead of being consumers of natural products, they are carnivorous and they prey on bodies that also violates this cycle. So mm -hmm. think about those rock vegans. Rock vegans, I like that. <laughs> I mean, at that point, I can see myself play playing a mountain dwarf who's a druid, but is absolutely allowed to wear plate mail because he's just retrieving this. Yeah, to take it back to the mountains with. Right. Eventually, like right. thinking about like like BX and like basic and OSC and other systems at eighth level, kind of like a like a dragon horde. Instead, 
you're eventually going to just start consuming it till you become a mountain yourself. So yeah, you can't make that plate mail, but you can keep it and use it because eventually it's used to make other dwarves through the circle of life. Okay. So we're talking like long-term consumption of <laughs> these metals and all that. So are we talking physically <laughs> or literally? I mean, I, I imagine, so, you know, when you think about like the original, like BX and such, the demi human races stopped at a certain point. It was like eight for some, or, or depending if you do which box set, there at some point you just take the character out of play. So I imagine that you just have this like, crazy mineral eating dwarf that's like yeah now i got everything that i can come out it's just like spends the rest of his life getting nutrients just becoming a large imagine like a stalagmite just like growing over time just growing. Just like, like, like a zorn or other creature just like yeah. and just growing corpulent so you just root in place and just eat all the mineral all the things that you've gathered and then you just you know like you tap into the ley line make a mountain Man, oh. part of me just listening to this is finding ties into dwarves and giants again, but more that dwarves are evolving into these giants as they become mountains. You know, they yeah. feast, they eat kind of like hill giants, they become mm -hmm. the stone of stone giants and continue to grow larger and larger. And uh, you might wonder if, like, is there a ritual among dwarves to contact, um, and I'm sorry, I forgot your legendary figure. Crag? Crag um, Beard. Crag Beard. Could you do a ritual shaman thing and actually have Crag Beard, the mountain dwarf, talk oh, to you as a mountain? Absolutely. <laughs> I have that imagined as like a dream so that like, um, uh, that like if you were to have like omens of this figure or see the mountain in your dreams, it would have certain types of things. So it would make perfect sense to either tap into like the primordial ley line forces that would connect you to like the crust and mantle of the earth or to have, you know, uh, atavistic or like avatar figures of this uh, uh, mountain appear. Um, probably more, it, it would be interesting to have it be like abstract things since it is literally once you're a mountain, there's nothing more concrete than that. So it would break some sense of, of, of wonder to break from that, but Definitely, absolutely. I think it would make total sense. And of course, we'd have to speak in deep, gravelly tones. Oh yeah, yeah. At you know, atmosphere. And that's I'm a guessing. yes and. I want to hear. It. Uh, I'm picturing what I'm picturing in my head: never-ending story, the rock yes. riders, rock eater. Exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, so that, that's, a that's good exactly that, that's exactly what I'm thinking, and that yeah, exactly. is awesome. Like once he's in his evolutionary form, becoming a mountain, yeah, it's just he's a rock eater. He's just yeah. I love that. That is awesome. I actually love because that a lot. It would be interesting because then, if you had a PC that became the level that you be that would be become this proto mountain, it'd become an excellent NPC. And like, if something was catastrophic that he, he like interrupted the the process of that life cycle. That can make like a very crazy naturalistic villain as well. Like here's this mountain that like halfway something stole its horde, like humans came and stole its horde. Now you got an angry fucking mountain. It's just like, I'm going to beat you and crush you to go and eat your metals. Like that'd be absolutely frightening. It's and not evil. Your you corpses on it. top of that. You, you it's see this corpses are coming for you. <laughs> or it becomes this apocalyptic figure. Yeah. It's just like suddenly, all of a sudden, you see a mountain range like uh, yeah. the 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 splendor of like the Colorado Rockies, and then yes. suddenly it and stands up. <laughs> you know? There are settings that deal with like early or like low magic uh, medieval settings. Um, and so you could easily place the dwarves in that. That's where it would be in its heyday, in its zenith. But you could also have a reemergence. So after you've had the Iron Age and the humans and the other races have like bored out these mountains and there's a disruption in natural form, these primordial dwarves come back to like reset balance. Like you're saying like uh, druid dwarves and you have the fucking mountains just going to war against existence and humanity to like, Reestablished, put more corpses on me so we can like reseed the minerals in the earth. I mean, what's more frightening than a natural force that's not evil or bad? It's just it is, and you have to fight it. Mountain kaiju at this yeah. point, or, or Tarask. Yeah, 
That would be awesome. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go on to Frank. Let you think about the next part here. <laughs> Frank, what's Sorry, your uh, legendary gnomish figure? Uh, exemplifies gnomes as they see it. You know, I, I have the perfect figure. Wait, uh, how on. I... is it? Or is it? <laughs> this one actually has a name. So, uh, and, and it's actually going to harsh on Professor Ian's uh, recitation because Lolo, the giant cleaver, uh, oh. As as he glossed over certain aspects of uh, history, which most historians do, uh, Lolo, like many other Miroc gnomes, uh, like to collect the primordial ooze because unbeknownst to, to the dwarves, because they are stupid, uh, the primordial ooze can be used to go ahead and remove the stone shielding from the gems, saving you calluses on your hands and being able to pull uh, the minerals and jewels from the earth without having to toil at work. Uh, Lolo, Lolo was off looking for some of this primordial ooze when she was climbing what she thought was a mountain, but it turned into a giant old one. One of the other portions of history that Professor Ian has glossed over was <laughs> the War of Oxnard and the Elders, or what the Elders called the upheaval of what was. In this case, uh, the younger, more youthful dwarves uh, were rebelling against their older taskmasters, which had risen in great stature, almost to giant level. As Lolo was seeking out the primordial ooze, she stumbled upon the front line of this. Seeing a large gathering of the primordial ooze, she assumed that the giant kind, mountain dwarves, were the bearers of it and were dishing it out to the smaller. She, unknown to history, slipped off the ledge and as she tumbled down, she took her weapon and it went right through the general of the old one's skull, cleaving him in half, landing next to the primordial ooze. As the giants on one side and the other stood in stunned silence, she quickly gathered him, gave her mothers a shout out, <laughs> and stole the primordial ooze. Uh, she returned later to gather the corpses from the fight that followed, and traded that to the goblin kind for necessary items as well. Because we go. goblins are sentient creatures now and they have certain aspects that can help. Uh, but for the most part, the rock gnomes hide in the shadows of the great old ones. And kind of, uh, they're kind of scavengers, if you will. A waste not, want not is what I'm hearing a lot of. That's a good one. Uh, now, so do the uh, rock gnomes, do they know that it was a slip, or was it this mighty blow? That Legend Lolo has it that Lolo, without regard to her own safety, attempted to put an end to the conflict and steal the primordial ooze to herself. She, in her own words, did a triple backflip, uh, taught to her by executed it perfectly, and cleaved right down the center of General Old One. Ta-da, motherfuckers. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. I'm just going to ride you in To, to yeah. expound upon that, okay, my goblins or whatever facilitate what Frank just said. They're able to use the things that, that his race provides and stuff. But <clears throat> The goblins are responsible stewards and the things that they create do not last. And they do that on purpose. They're, they are biodegradable <laughs> and it seeps back into the soil. There we go. Nice. We're all just leeches for uh, Ian's mountain dwarves. I, I see that. <laughs> the goblins become the facilitator on how to live harmoniously with this they, they no, you, you guys are capitalists that. because you give us a product the product expires then we have to buy more product exactly. you're the, the <laughs> drug dealer of breaking bad <laughs> if it's first taste is free guys if it's <laughs> free then you are the product 
the, the, the goblins are ice and Eisenberg. There we go. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh man. I'm trying to think if I have questions, but I think they've been fully <laughs> answered. I thought, I, thought we were, I thought the last one was about class. Or yeah, yes, no, I was thinking specifically for oh, I'm sorry. I was in legendary thinking. stories, unless either of you have questions. So, waste not, want not, and it sounds like one strike works smarter, not harder. One strike can end end a conflict, is what I'm Using the hypotenuse of the triangular vector from the fall of said shale covered. And the one. strength and nimbleness of doing all those backflips and acrobatics mm -hmm. land said perfect blow. Think uh, Errol Flynn going right down the sail, only in this case, it is a rocky old giant. Wow. Okay. And cat butt on top of that. <laughs> yeah. Cat butt. Cat uh, whoa. <laughs> oh, whoa. No, I'm just uh, so is it a male or female? This is snacks. That's how you find out, right? I, I we're going to express. When you're talking about goblins, this is definitely a, a goblin. Oh, yeah. That's a goblin. <laughs> All right. David, back to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Most races, as we know them today, have some special feature uh, mm -hmm. when you choose them as a race. Dwarves get their uh, uh, dwarven armor training and their axes and hammers. Elves have some high elven magic or some odd thing like that. Um, goblins, we are goblins. What do they necessarily start off with? Because they venerate uh, mm -hmm. Nilbog so much, they try to... Uh, uh, a live like Nilbog, and so naturally these goblins have what to them? Uh, they are going to have like proficiencies. They'll have proficiencies in uh, things that that kind of enhance their their lust for life. So you know, it's like okay, the uh, one of the things that that you could have you could roll uh, how many how many attributes are there? In, in the skills, abilities, or something like that. You know, persuasion, blah, 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 all the way down. How many are there total? 12? Sure. 12 or 14. Okay. <laughs> Roll a d20 and whatever. And, the, you know, for so many times, that becomes your proficiencies. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, that, let's scrap that. Throw that up. All and right. And all that. They're like the art artificers. Uh, their inherent thing is flash of genius. So, so you'll have a dice roll that you can use, or whatever, to add towards an ability check or something like that. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like, kind of like a, between a bard and an artificer, they can just, you know, like inspiration, As, you know, flash of do, genius. Yeah. As we have goblins that you know are touched by Nilbog, Nilbog still touches. Touches these touches, <laughs> yeah. With instances of genius, I like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, they were created by a wizard, and so every once in a while, that flash of insight comes through them. All right, I dig it. Yep. David, is there any type of like dairy related skill? I'm just pulling off the whole Nilbog vibe. Dairy related skill. Oh dairy. my god. Oh yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Green milk. <laughs> <laughs> Anim animal husbandry yes and i saw that movie and yeah, so, yeah, oh, a movie God. about goblins called hobgoblins so it's like <laughs> there were no goblins whatsoever they were hobgoblins yep so. and they're all vegans yep they're vegans kyle you're making a face have you not seen the movie i've not seen this movie you've not oh, seen it, troll oh, 2 troll it, it was made yes. before he was born yeah, Troll 2. That's the movie. I was thinking Hobgoblin. Yeah. Yes, Troll 2. Troll uh, see, 2. No, I have seen uh, Ernest versus those Scare trolls. With the milk of the mother's milk. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, to our audience, if you haven't, uh, if you haven't already seen Troll 2, check the it worst, out. It the worst, is so bad. <laughs> the best worst movie ever made. Uh, it is better than the room. I said it. You know, crucify me on um, social media, whatever. Yeah, Troll 2, folks. Check it out. So, and the town, what is the name of the town, Ian? Nilbog. There we go. <laughs> the connections are just oh, astounding. If, if a sexy witch offers you an ear of corn, you definitely eat it. Eat it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> that All scene right. alone is worth it watching the movie, it folks. Is. The sexy corn eating scene. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, what changes to the dwarves and how does that reflect upon them as a race in general? Have Absolutely. You made? Um, in, in a 5e capacity, I would say that it would be an a, uh, alternative class, that if you were to pick the mountain dwarf, that it would be its own class and racial bundle in one. So it would confer some kind of um, uh, basic level uh, proficiencies that you would have advantage on thrown rock weapons or improvised weapons, which tend to be very weaker in uh, balance. So that would add an inherent balance, stone stents, those kind of things. But in place of like that metallurgy or other things, um, there would be three kind of um, class paths that you could do. You would have like the venerators, which would be the more like shamanistic role that uh, Frank and Kyle have touched on. To main balance with the earth to commune with the mountains you would have like the hoarders or the questers that would be people those would be uh dwarves that would either become mountain seeds themselves their ultimate function would become mountain or to acquire enough wealth and material to help another more advanced dwarf become its way towards uh, mountainhood or guardians those that protect the sanctity of the mountains and the life cycle itself so from there, you would have offshoots that would give you skill bundles that, and proficiencies that would be more towards um, like basic low-level magic functions that would be balanced out with fighting. Um, your hoarder quester would be much more like your prototypic um, adventuring, so more combat focus, uh, um, but with more skills for dealing with situations. Guardians would be just your straight up tanks. Uh, for social element, there would be racial hatred towards uh, like goblins and affinity towards slime creatures and other, other primordial races that live in harmony. Uh, perhaps also, again, having Jubilux as a uh, patron deity that is not evil. Um, yeah, those are, those are my notes. That's my lecture. Um, All I right. I guess if we were to like kind of uh, make a comparison like uh, with the goblin ideal that I came up in mind with and with the lore, uh, the new race, the Verdan at uh, uh, Acquisitions Incorporated, they were actually transformed, I think, by Jublix from goblin into their new form of, you know, what they call sexy goblin. So, <laughs> you know... <laughs> So yeah, so I think it, I think it's it's either Jublix or or it's one of the great old ones that transformed them. As a matter of fact, also like their blood is actually black. You know, oh, yeah, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. So. But anyway, sorry. No, not, you're not, fine. Not, Absolutely. Not Ask away. Yeah. So. So Frank. yeah. It's... Oh, sorry. Uh, did no. you have a question, David? No, that was it. That was a All flash. Right. That was a flash of genius, right there. That was a flash. So, uh, yeah, no, it works. Uh, Frank, uh, how is your race changed uh, in ways that are entirely different than rock gnomes as we know them today? Rock gnomes in the alternative universe are actually more of a ranger uh, class type uh, from the old school, the Tui, in the fact that only three of them can operate together at any single time. Uh, they are few and far between. They do not live that long and are overly uh, arrogant uh, with their own intellect, thinking that they are smarter than the average bear, so they do not need assistance. Uh, however, their flashes of brilliance are more akin to Archimedes in the fact that when they do put their mind to something, it can be quite intricate, but it is exceptionally functional as well. Uh, they use this to uh, retain, obtain, and sell off the primordial goo uh, that they so desperately seek as they feel that it adds to their intelligence. So they're actually kind of smart rangers. So you bring in the spell component, and the primordial ooze is responsible for twisting their psyche to allow them to go ahead and use the mysticism of nature itself. Uh, so they're more druid than mage uh, because they have things such as entangle, uh, 
Uh, they can control the rock slides and things of that nature. Uh, so they're kind of a cross between current mountain dwarves and current rock gnomes, uh, but more ranger-esque, a la Lolo uh, the Giant Cleaver. Uh, the other thing that makes them different is the only reason they get jewels is to trade with the goblins. They have no innate currency. They are more along the lines of a barter system. So there is no envy. There is no greed with them. They just know they need something to trade to get something else that they need. Uh, they are certainly not warlike because their stature is small and their martial abilities are eh, at best. Uh, I think the uh, one of the mantras that the rock gnomes has comes from who once uttered no. <laughs> once uttered no. Wow. Yeah. Deep, inspiring words from. I, you know, or hit it on the head. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing more needs to be said. He has spoken. I, I just, I have to add, like, every time you say ooze, I just want to say, like, secret of the ooze. <laughs> secret <laughs> ooze. I, I am simply writing your coattails with your storyline, so I'm just oh, going to... Oh, I was, this is going to end up in a murder hobo. I was episode. thinking about TNT 2, Secret of the Ooze. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, the, uh, the vault of the ooze. Frank is writing all this down, so you're going to have smart goblins, you're going to have the... Yeah, that's going to be the next episode. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. It'd be Guys. free watching this crap. <laughs> that is true. Uh, it's Guys, that is Iron GM tonight. We have the ranger gnomes that are too intelligent, honestly, for their own good. <laughs> we have the gourmand goblins touched by mm -hmm. magic in their very bloodline and DNA. <clears throat> and we have mountain dwarves who are literally seeds of mountains in the shape of men for right now. Guys, you decide uh, who's the winner because honestly, I know who it is, and we that's all everyone who's winners. watching right now, <laughs> writing this down, stealing all of these ideas. I just got an email from the University of Phoenix, Ian. I believe you have a job waiting for you to <laughs> teach <laughs> medieval uh, studies. Is it tenure? Is it tenure? <laughs> Yeah, Not, uh, you gotta yeah. be there two years for tenure. It's on like one on one human sexuality and human growth and development. So yeah, yeah there you go. I'm getting a second call. You've been fired. <laughs> <laughs> it was the human sexuality course. Right? It was the human sexuality. Yeah, it, it was the pictures you sent in for your human sexuality. Uh, they do not accept things copyrighted by. Brazzers. <laughs> oh, I worked for three years at the Sex Research Institute. Seriously. <laughs> you did not waste any time. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right, guys. Time follow well us on spent. Twitch. Follow us on Twitter. If you want to take a look at our YouTube archives, make sure you catch this episode again and again so you get those notes just right. You can do that over on YouTube. If you want to be in the show between the roles, get some answers to some interesting questions you might have or participate in one of our one-shots, not this Saturday, next Saturday, hit us up at mhoboinc at gmail.com or again at Twitter. You want to talk to us on Discord, talk about these ideas? We've got that going on for us. If you want to not look at Frank's... Well, honestly, there's so much hand signals. I'm not going to promote the audio podcast for this Just particular no. one. No, no. Because <laughs> you do have to watch the hand signals to understand what Frank's half saying half the time. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Oddfish Game, for their Adventure Sense. Do your game stink because you have Pirate Dog Poop Dice? Adventure Sense. Finally, uh... Sign up for the con! Earth Sign up for the con! con. And, uh, nice. Let's all murder hobo cancer together at Murder Hobo Concert. All right, good night, everybody. Wave. Bye! Bye. Bye. Bye.